it's a, it's a very exciting time to be um, working on architecture for machine learning because unlike things where you're just um, making it go a little faster, as Olivia said, machine learning really is enabled um, by hardware. I'm hoping this just works, yeah. Except the, so if you look at the, uh, unless you've been hiding under a rock, the, the AI revolution is upon us, and this time it's for real. This is the third AI revolution. There were promises of uh, great AI in the 1960s that were put an end to by uh, Minsky and Papert's book on perceptrons. It happened again in the 1980s. What's interesting is that all of the techniques being applied today, with some exceptions, were around in the 1980s, but the core elements were there. Convolutional neural networks were around in the 80s. Um, training with stochastic gradient descent and backpropagation was around in the 1980s. Um, lots of the key elements um, were there, were demonstrated, but it didn't take off, and the simple reason was that there wasn't enough data, and, and the real reason is that there wasn't enough compute. I think people would have come up with the data had the compute been there. Today for computer vision, um, this shows what when people are using sort of old school computer vision techniques, the kind of recognition they got, and what's happened since with deep learning. It's completely upended the field. It rendered you know, entire people's careers designing manual feature detectors obsolete. Now the way you do computer vision is you basically you know, take a bunch of labeled training data, drop it into a neural network. It discovers better features than people have spent their careers um, um, inventing. The same is true for speech. It used to be people would make their careers um, designing the world's best phoneme detectors. When I was on the faculty at MIT, a guy named Victor Zuz claimed to fame as he had the best speech system because he had been able to uh, recognize phonemes better. In fact, he taught an IAP class at MIT on how to read sonograms. So you could look at the sonograms or the uh, spectrograms and, t and tell what the phonemes were, and that was how he trained the network. Now people just drop um, the uh, spectrograms in, your know, frequency um, uh, spectra every 20 milliseconds, and it learns better features than he spent his career developing. Um, it beats human players at Go using interesting hybrid of classical tree exploration um, and deep learning for the scoring functions. Um, so wherever you look, um, deep learning is everywhere. You, you find it on the, uh, um, yeah, on the uh, internet. Um, it's uh, revolutionizing healthcare. It's better at reading mammograms and, and diagnosing whether skin lesions are cancerous or not than trained um, human experts are. Um, it's uh, changing a lot of things in media and entertainment and NVIDIA we're applying it very broadly to computer graphics and it can do wonderful things like denoise ray traced images so we can get by instead of using 10,000 rays per pixel in an image we can get by with one to three rays per pixel and have the image quality look as good. Um, we're also using it in collaboration with um, gaming companies to do facial animation. It used to take an artist um, weeks even after you had motion captured video to um, take the 300 different control points in a typical rig of a, of a character's face and animate the face. Um, now we can do that automatically from a combination of audio recording and video recording um, using machine learning to basically learn the correspondence of you know, intonation of the audio and, and uh, um, various key features from the video to how the rig should be manipulated. Um, it's um, ch changing security. It used to be, you know, we have video cameras everywhere. The city of London is covered more than one-to-one -one with video cameras, but they're used after the fact, right? After something bad happens, you look at the video cameras and find out who did it. Um, now we can basically have intelligent agents behind every one of those cameras and spot anomalies as they occur, or perhaps even the, the things leading up to the anomaly before it occurs and be able to, to intervene. And then again, something we're very interested in in NVIDIA, we actually have a very large program developing self-driving car technology. We run two fleets of self-driving vehicles, um, one out of our uh, Santa Clara headquarters and one out of our New Jersey um, offices. And it's, it's getting to the point where it is better than humans at, at driving cars. It has the potential of reducing traffic deaths uh, substantially from the current 1.2 million a year. Um, I do want to emphasize a lot of people tend to be afraid that this is basically rendering all of us irrelevant. But, but um, AI doesn't replace humans, it enables them, it makes them more powerful uh, by basically you know, being a, a, an assistant and an aid um, to, to magnify our um, abilities. Now this AI revolution has been enabled by hardware. Um, again, all the key technologies were around in the 1980s. The two things that were missing were large enough data sets to train a large network without overfitting, um, and hardware that was powerful enough to actually train it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, and now that we have um, you know, powerful GPUs to train these networks, um, deep learning is being gated by hardware. Um, I talked to lots of people who would like to use larger networks and train them on larger data sets, and they simply uh, are limited by what they can train 
in about two weeks seems to be the threshold of patients, and that threshold seems to be coming down. Um, to give you an idea of, of how in things are increasing, um, for image recognition, going from AlexNet, which was the you know, uh, original thing that sort of spurred deep learning in, in, um, in uh, uh, vision, um, it's uh, 16 times larger model size going to ResNet in 2015. And what isn't really shown here is that it would have been 160 times, you know, but for the innovations um, that came with GoogleNet. So the, the progression was AlexNet one ImageNet in 2012, um, VGGNet, which was about an order of magnitude larger in, in parameters, won the competition um, in 2013. In 2014, GoogleNet won with a substantial improvement over VGGNet um, at substantially less um, um, effort by using the inception modules, which basically use one-by-one one convolutions to reduce the number of feature maps before applying the more expensive three-by-three three convolutions. So by sort of doing something which is an order of magnitude more efficient, um, they're able to get better recognition at essentially the same level of performance. If it weren't for that innovation, it would be even more expensive over that period. Speech goes up 10x per year. There, there are currently um, networks in, in uh, natural language processing with, with billions of parameters um, that require, again, a couple orders of magnitude more performance than this. Um, so, so what we'd like to do is be able to solve even um, larger networks on larger, train larger networks and larger data sets to get better accuracy to tackle more subtle problems, and we're limited on doing that by the hardware that we can get today. So let me give a, a quick uh, DNN primer since I'm going first, and there are probably, uh, probably almost everybody in the audience knows this already, but there are probably a few architects who have been hiding under a rock for the last few years, um, and I appreciate you coming out from under the rock. Uh, typical neural network has multiple layers of neurons. The input uh, layer is where you apply your input. Uh, pix pixel values for an image, um, things like text are typically encoded one hot, so every character would be 26 neurons, one of which will be a one, the rest will be zeros. Um, um, speech comes in typically already processed with an FFT, although some people are just putting raw audio samples in and letting the network learn um, the, uh, the orthonormal transform itself. Each layer is a matrix vector multiply. You take the vector of the previous layer, multiply it by a matrix of weights, and then apply a nonlinear function, and, and the result is, is, the, is the next layer. You repeat this process, and you get to the output layer. The output layer, if you're doing classification, is, is ultimately a one-hot, although it's usually preceded by what's called a soft max layer, which gives you a soft one-hot. Um, so, so for example, example, if you're classifying, you'll have one output neuron to say it's a dog, a different one to say it's a cat, and so on. Um, if you're doing detection, you'll output bounding boxes in addition to the classification. Um, for text to text, um, you'll be outputting characters again in a one hot configuration. It turns out that you can do image networks with what's called a fully connected um, network like this, but it's inefficient. So most people who operate on images um, use convolutional neural networks where you basically take advantage of two things. One is that the, the uh, receptive field for any one feature map in the previous feature map is relatively small. So rather than having every pixel depending on every pixel of the previous feature map, it depends on a small region, typically a three by three um, region. Um, and then you share weights, so every pixel uses the same set of weights for the corresponding pic pixels in the previous set of feature maps. And so it becomes a 3D convolution where to compute one pixel here, I basically convolve a, say, three by three by however many feature maps, often as many as 512 of the previous layer to compute that pixel and then apply the nonlinear function. To give you an idea of the type of computation, the amount of computation needed to do this, um, ResNet 50, which is not the most complex network, but was, it's one that we actually use as a workhorse for a lot of things. Um, you'll recall that ResNet um, 152, a network that's roughly three times the size, um, was the uh, ImageNet winner a couple of years ago, um, requires for a single um, 225 by 225 image um, almost 8 billion op operations. Um, if you really want to process 225 by 225 images, that's um, a quarter of a teraop um, to go 30 frames per second. But people don't want to process 225 by 225 images. For our self-driving cars, we tend to use HD cameras. And so we're processing images that are 1920 by 1080. Very often we actually cut that in half vertically because the sky is not very interesting. So we'll have a sort of a 1920 by 540. Question? Is this for training or for performance? Yes. So it turns out it's, it's this, the same number of operations in the forward pass for both. 
Uh, for training, they're typically 16-bit floating point operations, and you really should triple the number because in addition to that forward pass, you have a reverse pass uh, to calculate the activation gradients, and then you actually have an additional um, pass to take those activation gradients and calculate the weight gradients. So triple it and make them um, floating point 16 for training. Um, for inference, you can typically do with 8-bit um, int or, uh, or less, as I'll talk about shortly. Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but just because we are recording, if you can repeat. I'll repeat the question. Right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. For the next okay. Question. For the next question. Yeah. So, so this is a challenge. Um, you know, you, you can't take your average computer um, and do this, and it's a challenge to scale this as the networks get more complex and we get larger data sets, um, because Moore's law is dead, um, or at the very least kind of twitching and, and waiting for the corner to get there and declare it dead. And, and so we, we really need to find some way of, of getting more performance and more performance per unit energy to enable this technology to continue to grow, and, and the answer is, is specialization. Let me start by talking about what everybody uses to do deep learning today um, for, for both um, training and inference, which is GPUs. Um, this May at our uh, GPU technology conference, we introduced our Volta generation of GPUs. Each of our generations is named after a scientist. Um, and uh, Volta is, a, is an enormous chip. The chip itself is actually the, the rectangle in the middle here with the NVIDIA logo on it. Um, th these four things around the outside are stacked high bandwidth memories. Um, but the Volta chip itself is, is 815 square millimeters, an enormous die. It's about the biggest you can make, with 21 billion transistors. Um, and it's, um, you know, if you're a scientist doing particle simulations, you're concerned with the fact that it's 7.5 teraflops of floating point 16 performance. It's you know, comparable to the machine on the top of the top 500 list in the early 2000s. Um, but actually, if you're interested in doing deep learning, um, what you're interested in is, uh, is the fact that it has an instruction um, we call HMMA for half precision um, matrix matrix uh, multiply and accumulate um, that does 120 um, FP16 flops on the core in inner kernel. And this is actually an example of specialization. You can do specialization by building a dedicated accelerator. You can also do specialization by creating instructions that are specialized for an application. And by doing that, you create a unit of work large enough per instruction that the overhead of fetching the instruction, decoding it, and issuing it, all of the other things that go on um, in a general purpose computing unit are completely amortized out. They're essentially in the noise, and the bulk of the energy is actually going to doing you know, the math of this instruction. And this gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility because you essentially get the efficiency of an accelerator, um, but you have the generality of a, of a general purpose processor that you can program to do things other than just um, interpret neural networks. So that may be the bulk of the workload um, for, for many of these. The other thing that's key in balancing the performance um, of, of this processor is that it has nearly a terabyte per second of memory bandwidth to the HBM2 memory. Um, the uh, train, training of these networks is memory intensive, both in terms of capacity and, and in terms of um, bandwidth. And if you wind up with a lot of flops and not enough bandwidth, um, you wind up with a chip that's idling all the time waiting on its memory system. So this is our solution for the data center, whether you're doing training in the data center or inference in the data center. And I will point out that a lot of Internet of Things applications actually do their inference in the data center. If you have a thermostat that's a, a smart thermostat in your house, um, it doesn't make a lot of sense to be running the neural network on that thermostat. It's much easier to take the data, pipe it up to the cloud, do the inference there, and then pipe the, the um, instances back. The only time you really need to do inference in a device is when you either have a latency constraint, as you do in a self-driving car, right? You can't see the pedestrian in the crosswalk, send the image up to the cloud, do the inference, send the data back, and say, hit the brakes. You've smushed them by then. Um, or you're disconnected, which, which occasionally happens in cars as well. So in those cases, um, we also have a solution for, for doing inference in IoT devices that are um, disconnected or with latency constraints, and it's our um, latest Tegra chip, our Xavier, Xavier chip, which is sort of the Volta generation of, of Tegra. And in addition to having 512 uh, Volta GPU cores, approximately one-tenth those um, that are in uh, the V100, um, it has a deep learning accelerator um, to accelerate the inference computation. Um, and the way to think about this, this deep learning accelerator is um, it, it provides 20 teraops of, of additional um, deep learning performance on top of the 10 teraops you get out of the Volta cores. Um, 
And it, it really does this in a way that you can think of as being like a Google TPU, but better, and better in two ways. Um, the, the core of it is, is a Mac array that if you're doing 8-bit integer operations is 2K 8-bit integer operations, sort of a, a 32 by 64 systolic array that's piping activations by weights. Um, but the two things that are in it that you won't find in, in other uh, deep learning accelerators that people are at least shipping at this point um, is support for sparsity. It turns out, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, is that um, most of the activations are mostly zero. Um, and most of the weights can be made mostly zero. Um, so that if you simply do dense computations, if you do dense matrix vector multiplies for the fully connected layers and dense convolutions for the convolutional layers, you're doing often an order of magnitude more work than you need to do by multiplying zero by zero. Um, and so by providing support for sparsity, the, the DLA winds up being much more efficient at these computations. The other is it has support for um, doing Winograd transformations. Um, most people are familiar with the fact that if you do a convolution, it's with an m by n kernel, it's n squared operations. Um, but you can reduce that um, to a single operation by doing an FFT before and after. So you can turn um, you know, what, what would have taken, for example, nine uh, multiply accumulates for a three by three convolution into one um, if you're willing to pay for the transform before and after, because you basically um, FFT turns convolution into a pointwise multiply. Winograd operates in a similar way, but it's a slightly more efficient transform, and we have native support uh, for that here. It winds up giving a factor of um, two and a quarter to four X, depending on the size of the Winograd kernel you need. Um, so the way to think about this energy efficiency-wise um, and, and um, is, to, is that if you start with sort of a CPU as a baseline, and the CPU is sort of becoming like the VAX was in the 1980s, you know, sort of the, uh, or the 1970s, the sort of whipping uh, boy because it's so easy to compare against. Um, you can do a little bit better, you know, going to an FPGA. You can do, you know, a lot better than that um, by going to GPUs that really don't have any specialized instructions um, like Pascal, but were tuned um, for, the, for the workload to some extent. If you then specialize the instruction, you can get within a factor of two of what you can do with a dedicated accelerator and retain the flexibility. So if in a data center where you may want to you know, use this processor for different workloads, you may want to be doing image preprocessing at one point in time, be doing um, you know, graph analytics at another point in time, and be doing deep learning um, at, at a third point in time. It really makes a lot of sense to have the programmable processor, but with instructions that are efficient enough um, that you're basically you know, within a small fraction of what you could do with a dedicated accelerator. Um, and then when you actually are in an embedded device where that last factor of two is important, um, to use the deep learning accelerator. So with that as a baseline, let me talk about the techniques that can be used to make uh, deep learning on hardware even more efficient. Um, so the first of these um, is um, reducing precision. Now, uh, what does it do to your computation when you reduce precision, and what do you gain by doing it? And what it does to your computation is that it limits you in two ways. Um, the first is in terms of dynamic range, and the second is in terms of accuracy. Um, now, it turns out that for training, dynamic range is very important. Um, but what we've discovered is that you don't really need the, um, um, you, know, you know, sort of 70 order of magnitude dynamic range that you get from FP32 if you're willing to do a little bit of scaling. It turns out if you naively try to apply FP16 um, to training, um, depending on your network, you will probably fail because the, um, the sort of magnitudes of both the forward and reverse propagation passes at different layers won't fit into the nine order of magnitude range that you have here. But in any single layer, in any one direction, they will. And therefore, you can do pretty well if you're willing to apply a single scale factor per layer per direction to center um, your, your activations and weights on this range. FP16 is more than enough. Um, int 16 or int 16 with a block exponent is not. You actually need the dynamic range of having that exponent per layer. Um, and, and an accuracy of 0.05% of is more than enough. Um, um, for inference, you, you can get by with 8-bit integer. It's widely used in, in uh, that data center inference today. And in fact, as I'll discuss shortly, you can get by with way less than that, with just a few bits or even a single bit uh, per weight. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important for two reasons. Um, if you compare to 32-bit floating point, a 32-bit floating point multiply is four, almost four picojoules. Um, if you can reduce this, um, the cost of multiplies goes quadratically with the number of bits because you, you create a set of partial products um, that, that is n squared if n is, n is your number of bits. 
So if you can, if you can go down to an 8-bit multiply, you reduce this not 4x, you reduce it 16x. Um, and you actually reduce it to the point where the cost of your arithmetic is almost irrelevant um, because the cost of fetching um, data, even from a small SRAM, is far larger than the cost of doing that multiply. So if I can reduce precision, I can almost make my arithmetic irrelevant. And then uh, it becomes a question of how much energy am I spending on fetching from SRAMs and from data movement, um, and that energy becomes smaller proportionally to the number of bits um, that I get. Um, so it's really a question of reducing the number of bits to reduce the size of, of storage that's required. And this, this wins you two things. The first is I have to fetch fewer bits. So for example, if I go from 32 bits um, to 8 bits, I'm fetching four times fewer bits, and that's one quarter the energy. But the bigger gain is if you can capture a working set. It turns out that as, as I move up levels of the storage hierarchy, there's an order of magnitude more energy required at each level. So if I can fetch my bits from an SRAM that's small and local uh, to my unit, um, then it's five picojoules per 32-bit word. Um, you know, say say a, you know, a picojoule and in, in change per 8-bit um, byte. If I have to go globally to on-chip SRAM, um, it's an order of magnitude more. And by the way, you build this on-chip SRAM out of these arrays. So the SRAM energy is still five picojoules per bit. But now you add to that 45 picojoules per bit of wire energy, 45 picojoules per word of wire energy moving that data around. Um, so I'd really like to keep my data local um, and, and not go global. And I can do that if I can reduce the size of that data so it fits in a small local RAM. If, if my data is large, it won't fit. I've got to go uh, globally to that size or maybe even out to DRAM which is, you know, if I have to go off ship, it's yet another order of magnitude increase in energy. Um, so, so typically, um, people will use mixed precision. This sort of just gives one cartoon that I'll talk about shortly, where we keep the weights as four bits um, and activations as 16 bits, do a decode on the weights, do a 16 by 16 multiply and accumulate at 32 bits. Um, now, if energy is related to size of storage, um, you really don't want to waste it by doing something as naive as using um, integers or floating point numbers or really any representation that spaces your symbols uniformly. Um, that's a horrible waste. Uh, let me illustrate why here. Um, suppose I, I get four bits to represent a symbol. If I decide to represent it with a binary weighted um, representation, such as, as a typical integer, um, I have to space my symbols uniformly, like the green X's here. And what you see is this results in putting a lot of symbols out here where not very much interesting is happening, and then sampling very coarsely through the space where interesting things are happening. You do this and you realize you're not sampling this interesting part well enough, and you start increasing your number of bits until you, until you sample that well enough, which basically wastes even more symbols out here where nothing interesting is happening. Um, instead, what you'd like to do is quantize non-uniformly, basically use a code book so I can take my 16 symbols and plop them down in arbitrary locations. So I can sample um, under these lobes where, where interesting things are happening in the weights and not sample at all or only very sparsely out in the areas where not very much interesting is happening. And that way I can get the same or better accuracy with fewer bits. So uniform sampling is a very inefficient way of using precious bits. Um, so we developed a, a method called train quantization. It was um, best paper at the ICLR uh, conference last year. Um, and um, if you apply that technique um, to VGGNet on the ImageNet data set, you know, what we found is that the convolutional layers can be pruned, uh, can be compressed down to six bits per weight without any loss of accuracy. In fact, the accuracy we get at six bits per weight is substantially better than what you get with eight bit integers. Um, and if you're willing to deal with sort of eight bit integer level accuracy, you could go to four bits per weight. Basically, you get another factor of two um, before you start losing um, any substantial amount of accuracy. And for the fully connected layers, um, four bits um, loses no accuracy at all, is actually substantially better than eight bits per weight, and two bits per weight gives sort of eight bit integer level um, performance. Now more recently, we, um, we've been playing with binary and ternary networks. We had a paper at ICLR this year um, on uh, ternary weighted networks, which many, many people have been playing with. Our innovation was to use different um, weightings for the positive and negative side and to train in a way that, that we could actually vary um, the, the membership into the three classes of zero plus weight and, and minus weight. Um, and, and we're basically doing that by training both the, um, the, the weight factors and um, the, uh, the, the threshold. Um, 
but what we discovered when we started doing this is we at first got amazing accuracy. We were able to um, quantize to ternary weights with no loss of accuracy um, running um, CIFAR on a, on a bunch of different networks, in, in, in particular um, ResNet 18 and ResNet 50. Um, but then what we discovered is as we started increasing the size of the data set, um, our accuracy um, gap to um, using um, you know, quantized weights or full precision weights um, started to increase. And what we discovered is that this is really one dimension of capacity of a network. As, as, you, um, as you go through the, the art of network design where you decide what model you're going to use, how many layers, how many feature maps per layer, um, what the exact set of filters is used to compute each feature map, what you're really determin determining is what the capacity of that network is to learn a data set. And if you have a small data set, you don't need very much capacity. And therefore, you can either get by with a smaller network or you can use this, a large network and have very low precision weights. Um, if, on the other hand, you have a huge data set, you need both a large model and a certain amount of precision in the weights or you'll lose the capacity to actually learn that data set. And so I think the interesting thing to ask is, when you're at the limit of capacity of the network, what is the, the right representation for the weights? Or what is the right mix of, of designing a network? Maybe you actually want a larger model with lower precision weights um, to get the same result. But either way, you're much better off non-uniformly sampling your weights and trying to come up with some uniform um, sampling of them. N now that we've compressed our weights from sort of the starting position of 32 bits down to around 4 bits per weight, uh, to get the kind of accuracy that people um, are happy with. Um, the question is, do we need all of them? And in fact, you can, you can get an even greater gain than that 8x we just got going from 32 to 4 by throwing away most of your weights. Um, so it turns out that um, most of those weights aren't needed, um, much like the human brain. By the way, you have the most neurons you ever had when you were about one year old. Um, and then uh, by, by the adult time, you have about half that number of neurons. Um, and it isn't that you're dumber, you uh, ostensibly actually know more now than you did when you were one year old. It's just that your, your brain pruned away those neurons that weren't doing any, any useful work because they were dissipating energy and taking up storage in those little SRAMs. Um, and, and so um, you can do the same thing to, to, to these networks. And in fact, you can prune away a very large number of the weights. These are results for AlexNet from our paper at NIPS um, in 2015. And when we first started this out, we were a little bit disappointed. We said, oh, you can cut half the weights. So the dotted line here is what happens if you prune and don't retrain. You can cut roughly half the weights away before your accuracy starts really falling. But our insight came when we decided to retrain the network. So we would basically prune away the, the weights with low values and then apply um, a, a fine-tuning pass holding a, a sparsity constraint where we did not let those weights grow back. And if you do that, you get to the green line here. Um, where you can prune away about 80% of the weights before you lose any accuracy. And by the way, at lower um, pruning rates, uh, you actually gain accuracy. And in fact, a, a great way of improving the accuracy of almost any network is to, prune it, is to prune it and then let the weights grow back and do that a few times. And it's actually a wonderful regularization technique. Um, but if you, if you apply the pruning iteratively um, for AlexNet, you can wind up um, basically throwing away 90% of the weights and not losing any accuracy. And this is huge, both because you've just eliminated 90% of the operations, but more importantly, because you reduce the storage um, by about a factor of five. It's not 10, because you now need to keep uh, pointers around that say where you have weights and where you don't. Um, but, but by reducing that storage by a factor of five, you can now fit uh, most of these weights into a small working set that fits in a small SRAM, and that's the big gain. So, so we view deep compression as a pipeline where you first prune the network, get rid of all those weights that you didn't need, um, and then you basically train the code book. So for the weights that you have, you put your um, samples in exactly the right spot to make the most use of each, of each symbol. Um, if you combine the two together, um, you wind up being able to reduce the number of bits, and this is for VGGNet, um, by a factor of about 30. You're down to about 3% of the original size um, of the network, which is huge in terms of saving energy on, on fetching uh, parameters and activations. Um, when we first put this paper up on archive, about two weeks later, I got an a, a email, actually it was a phone call from Andrew Ng, um, uh, thanking me for this. And I said, well, why, why do you guys care? And, and it turned out it was something I didn't appreciate, which is Baidu at the time was uh, putting a lot of neural networks into mobile applications. And this compression enabled them to make the no mobile applications they could be downloaded over the, over the uh, 
telephone network rather than requiring Wi-Fi. We were much more interested in it because it reduces memory bandwidth requirements by 30 to 50x. And in addition to that, pulls you up at least one level in that memory hierarchy, giving you another order of magnitude savings in energy. So this is sort of 300 to 500x energy savings. Um, so the, the, the question arises then, um, how to implement these things. So it turns out that if, if you uh, have non-uniformly spaced weights um, and need a code book lookup, um, that actually winds up being painful on a lot of processors because you now have a table in direction in your, in your innermost loop. Um, and if you have sparse matrices, um, you know, the people in the library group tell you that it doesn't make sense to use the sparse matrix package until your uh, sparsity is 10%, uh, your density is 10% or less. So, so the question is, can you actually exploit sparsity that's more like 30% dense, and can you live with the, these table lookups? And the answer is, if you're willing to build hardware, um, it's easy. Now remember that most of our energy, once we're doing with low precision operations, isn't coming from the arithmetic. It's coming from the data movement um, and reading the SRAMs. So what winds up being critical here is actually how you tile your code and, and lay things out um, on a distributed array of processors to minimize data movement. Um, for fully connected layers, um, you know, Song Han and I at Stanford came up with an architecture we called the EIE, where we basically distribute um, uh, rows of our uh, connectivity matrix to processors and then use a compressed sparse column format within um, each processor for its subset of the rows. This allows us to do a scan over the activations to find the first non-zero activation. We broadcast that to all of the processors, and then they walk through their non-zeros um, in, in, in that column for, for the subset of rows that they have, accumulating their set of activations and finally applying the, the ReLU to it. Um, this makes for a very simple pipeline um, where the um, irregularity caused by the codebook lookup and the sparsity is, is, is essentially completely um, covered. Um, we basically start by taking uh, the non-zero activations as they're broadcast and queuing them up. This covers load imbalance. Um, we later actually found that we could train networks to eliminate the load imbalance. It's, what's wonderful with, with stochastic um, backpropagation is by defining your derivatives the right way and then putting various constraints on, you can get it to do almost anything. So if you tell it that you want to have the same number of non-zeros in each partition, it will do that. And you can basically train the load imbalance out of the network. Um, but, but before we did that, we basically just had an activation queue. So if one you know, um, processor's um, set of rows had five non-zeros, another one had three non-zeros, um, one would get a little ahead of the other, but over time they would catch up because on average they would have the same number. Um, you would take the, the um, activation at the head of the queue, which has both a value and an index. The index tells you what column you're working on. And you use the index to look up the pointer into the start of, uh, of weights for this column and the next column. You look up the next column so you know when this column ends. Um, you, you then basically take that point and walk the, the sparse matrix S SRAM, looking up for every non-zero where that, what the value of that non-zero is in this coded form and what its position is. And the position is coded in, in a uh, run between zeros. So for example, if, if I have um, run between non-zeros, if I have a non-zero, three zeros, and then another non-zero, I would put three in that position. Um, I have to turn that incremental um, format into an absolute format. Uh, that's just an address accumulator. Decode the weights, that's a simple table lookup. And then I do the normal math and, and store it. Um, the, the net result is shown here. This is the hardware implementation of, of the uh, efficient inf inference engine. What you see is it's all RAM. Uh, the sparse matrices are in these green areas. The, the two pointer tables, the pointer even the pointer odd table, are to the side. And the logic and arithmetic is almost irrelevant um, in the middle. Um, what's, what's interesting is that the right way to compare um, these things, um, the, the figure of merit is layers per joule. How many layers of a network can you do per unit energy? Um, and here, you know, compared to the, the Dian Now family or, or even uh, True North, if it's trying to run as a normal uh, um, neural network chip, not as a spiking chip, we're more than an order of magnitude more energy efficient process normalized and even not process normalized. Um, now, more recently, we've been looking at, at convolutional layers, and I'm going to give sort of some headlining for a paper that's going to be presented um, later at ISCA on our sparse convolutional network that for a typical um, convolutional network, and these are some layers of VGG, uh, you wind up with about 30% activation density and about 30% weight density, 30 to 
Um, and so if you multiply those together, you wind up with only about 10 to 20 percent of the multiplies being needed. Um, now the problem is, is that um, they, they wind up being needed in kind of an unusual way in that if I have a bunch of non-zero activations like this and a bunch of non-zero weights like this, I only want to multiply the dense areas here by the dense areas here, and it winds up sort of filling in the um, um, output activations until I apply the ReLU function. Well, it turns out one way to do this is to move all of your irregularity to the output side. So I'll basically fetch um, in, in whatever compressed format I have the next n non-zero activations and multiply them by the next n non-zero weights. So in this case, I'll have m um, activations by w weights. I'll multiply every non-zero by every non-zero because they all have to touch each other. And then it's just a question of where to put the resulting products. So I'll take the positions of the um, weights, think of that as the UV coordinate of the weight in that 3 by 3 convolutional kernel, and the XY coordinate of the um, activation, and I just add U and X and V and Y, and that gives me the position that I want to accumulate the result into. And so I, I now have just defined the need for an operation which is a scatter add. Now, there's an interesting trade-off here, um, because what I've done is I basically eliminated um, all of the multiplications that were being wasted multiplying zero by zero, but what I'm paying for that is I've made a summation a much more expensive operation. Remember, an add here is 0.03 picojoules, 30 femtojoules to do an add. Um, I, I now still have a 30 femtojoule add, but now I have to do a load and a store around each add because I'm not summing up the dot product that's going to one place at one time. And so um, it's, it's a difficult trade-off, and you have to have a certain amount of sparsity before that trade-off um, actually makes sense. I think I'm about to get flagged for the, the question time, so let me move um, through some of the um, result slides here. I think you'll be able to see those in the actual ISCA paper and, and wrap up. Um, it's a really exciting time to be a hardware architect. For many years, um, architects were kind of able to kind of coast along as the process people um, gave us technology that if we did nothing, gave us sort of a factor of three every process generation in terms of performance per watt. Now, now that Moore's Law is dead, if we actually want to get something in terms of performance per watt, we have to earn it ourselves. Um, and, and at the same time, um, you know, it's sort of a golden age of architecture because process technology isn't, isn't helping much anymore. Uh, we have this wonderful application area in, in AI and deep learning where we can make, you know, truly dramatic um, improvements to society in transportation, healthcare, and education by enabling new and more powerful neural networks to be applied to these areas. Um, this is an area where hardware has enabled the revolution. It was the final missing ingredient. You had most of the algorithms in the 80s. You had the large data sets you needed by the mid-2000s, but it wasn't until GPUs were applied to the problem in, in 2011, 2012, that people had the comp computational resources needed um, as well. Um, now that we've enabled it, we're gating it. The, the progress in, in deep learning is very much limited by the power of available hardware um, to, to train these networks. Today we, we have GPUs, which really um, exemplify specialization in two ways. You know, our data center GPU, the GV100, has um, specialization in, in the instruction set, where by defining a, a relatively heavyweight instruction, the antithesis of risk, by the way, in, in many ways, we're able to amortize um, the costs of the general purpose nature of the processor to the point where that doesn't matter, and the efficiency is really limited by the definition um, of that instruction. We get, you know, 120 um, uh, teraflops of, of FP16 performance for training. Um, an interesting metric here is, is 400 gigaflops per watt, and we have a uh, nearly terabyte per second um, memory system to basically keep that fed. Um, in embedded applications where you want to get maybe another factor of two performance improvement um, and perhaps have a little bit less die area by not carrying along a legacy graphics pipeline, um, you can basically build a deep learning accelerator, and, and by the way, I should have mentioned that we are open sourcing the RTL um, for our deep learning accelerator. It will be available on, on a very uh, um, you know, reasonable basis in, in about a month. Um, and uh, th there we have basically um, you know, 20 teraflops of, of deep learning performance at um, two teraflops per watt. Um, now it turns out that if you want to do better than this, um, there are really two things you need to do, and, and they really both boil down to the same thing, which is to reduce the size of your, of your model, because most of your energy is spent um, fetching data and moving it around, and so if you have less data to fetch and, and to move around, you burn less energy. So the first thing you want to do is throw away all the weights you don't need, and for fully connected layers, um, you can throw away 90% of the weights, 
For convolutional layers, you, you can throw away about two-thirds of the weights, and that gives you a commensurate increase in, in uh, performance. And it's actually more than commensurate, because remember, as I shrink things down, as soon as I drop through one of these levels of memory hierarchy, I gain another order of magnitude um, in energy. And then for every weight and activation that you keep around, you should represent it as efficiently as possible. Um, and our findings are that it takes um, four to six bits to represent weights with no loss of accuracy. For the loss of accuracy that people seem to be willing to accept by using 8-bit in inference, you can go down to two to four bits. Um, but to do that, you want to sample non-uniformly. You don't want to put all your symbols evenly spaced. Put your symbols where they do the most good. Um, now, you can go to binary or ternary representations, but when you do that, you're actually reducing the capacity of the network. And, and now you're getting into a realm where you want to design the model, you, you know, choose the network, the number of, of feature maps, the number of layers, and all of those parameters, along with the representation to co-optimize the amount of energy um, needed to implement it. As we do these optimizations, both the sparsity optimizations and the optimizations for using an efficient encoding of, of activations and weights, we create a regularity, but, but as we've demonstrated with the EIE and the SCNN accelerators, you can basically manage this irregularity through selective use of, of special purpose hardware. So thank you very much. I think I have a few minutes left for questions. So we got um, one here. Yeah, so the question is, uh, for the regular architectures that take advantage of sparsity, how do we program them? Well, for the accelerators, we don't program them, right? We, you know, we program them, you know, by choosing a model. Um, and then, basically, they're, they're hardwired to, to pump the model through, and typically by having very large instructions where an instruction corresponds to perform a layer. Um, and um, for, for when, they, when they basically get embedded into an instruction set, um, most of them actually will probably be captured in, in libraries. Um, so for example, if we wind up having a sparse matrix multiply instruction, um, that instruction may be difficult for an average programmer to get a lot of efficiency out of. We'll probably expose it uh, to the average programmer, but we'll have a library team um, have basically taken our, our you know, QDNN libraries and our support for about eight different um, frameworks that we currently support and have very heavily optimized um, the use of that instruction. Yeah, question back there. Can you uh, comment a little bit about the uh, open source that you mentioned? Um, all that we have announced to date is that we are going to open source it with initial availability in July and full availability in September. I, I'm actually not at liberty to say any more than that. That's the EIE or? Uh, no, that's the, D, the uh, NVIDIA DLA. The EIE is, is an academic project and is free to whoever wants it. Yes, yeah, so, so the question is, how much room is left for e efficiency improvement by specialization? So whenever I start a project, one thing I try to do is I try to figure out, you know, what is the, the speed of light? What, what is the best you could do if you eliminated all of, you know, instruction overhead and this and that? Um, and we've already exceeded that bound, because when I started out, I basically was assuming we would have to do the 32-bit floating point everybody was using at the time. And so I, I hate to put bounds on it, because people are very clever. And, and so as soon as you put a bound on, that bound is always based on some assumption. And if you can break the assumption, you can do better than the bound. Uh, that said, I think that um, the low-hanging fruit has been picked. And so I think it's getting harder and harder to get bigger performance improvements. Yes, yeah, so the question is, what is the pressure from the algorithms? Uh, you know, what pressure does moving to RNNs create? I don't know when we moved to RNNs. We, we were dealing with RNNs pretty much right from the very beginning. In fact, I think at NVIDIA, we have a little bit of a weakness that because the three verticals we're pursuing ourselves, self-driving cars, video analytics, and robotics, are very heavily vision-based, we tend to overemphasize convolutional networks, whereas for a lot of people, convolutional networks make up a very small fraction of, of their workload. Um, and I think, I think RNNs and, and simple fully connected networks are actually a much larger fraction in, in the wild overall. Um, and so, so we're very concerned about those. RNNs themselves, I think, present a lot of challenges because there's a, a certain sequential dependency um, in the training of them. They also have less sparsity in activations because they typically don't use ReLU 
um, nonlinearities. They, they typically will use 10H um, nonlinearities. And so they, there are challenges there, but I think that they can be overcome. And the question is always whether you can come up with one um, specialized instruction or a small set of specialized instructions that will handle all of those, whether you need to optimize them separately. So we have another question back there. So, so the question is, um, what benefit do we get from the non-uniform quantization? How many bits would you need with the uniform quantization? So um, I don't have the exact data. I, we, we, I could get Song to sort of uh, pull it up and, and give you the answer. But the short answer is um, you would need the full 32 bits to match six bits of, of um, non-uniform quantization for the convolutions. Um, and I think that if you compare to eight bits, again, it's, it's one of these things where you gain less as you go down. If you compare to 8-bit integer, which is what a lot of people use, you can get by with 4-bit non-uniform quantization. Um, and, and so as, as you, uh, the, the, right, the right chart to draw here is a chart plotting how many bits you use uniformly and then how many bits non-uniformly it takes to match that. And we haven't drawn that chart, but it would be a useful one to do. One more? With, from yes, yeah. Okay, so thanks for the comment. Yosha's comment was that they started using GPUs in 2009, not 2011. So I guess uh, that wraps it up. And uh, oh, there was, no question, I mean, well, there was somebody over here, I thought, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah.